everyone. My name is Christina and I'm the Family Programs Coordinator at the Vancouver Art Gallery and this is Melissa. How are you doing, Melissa? Good. Hi, everyone. I'm Melissa Lee. I'm the Director of Education and Public Programs at the Vancouver Art Gallery. Christina and I work together and we're so excited to beam into your homes today. So, Melissa, you're absolutely right. I'm also very excited to zoom into your homes today. And you know what, Melissa and I are very lucky. We have the cool jobs of getting to talk about artworks with other people. And of course, we know the best way to talk about artworks is being in the art gallery. We can look at the paint up close or walk all the way around sculptures, but we can't quite be in the art gallery together yet. But here we are together on screens on Zoom. Now, I bet by now, some of you might have used Zoom before. So let's take a quick second to look at how Zoom works. So here is a picture of me and you can see the green circle and that's circling a button. It's called the chat button. So if you click on that button, you can add your questions or ideas. You can even answer questions that Melissa and I asked throughout this session. You can even just say hi to everybody right now if you want to try it out. You can click on chat and uh, say hi to the group here. So, oh, everyone's starting to say hi. Welcome, welcome everyone. In this session, we're gonna talk about the power of determination, working passionately on what you love and how taking chances and trying new things, even if they're hard things to do, can create and transform what is possible. So, everyone here who's saying hi, I have a question for you. Have you ever seen anything outdoors? that made you feel kind of calm and thoughtful. Oh, and just to note, yeah, make sure you click all panelists and attendees when you're doing the chat so we can all see our comments and ideas. So Tessa's saying landscapes and water give you that feeling of kind of being calm and thoughtful. And Susanna's saying a waterfall. Uh, or Stephanie is saying the wind makes you feel kind of calm and thoughtful. A lot of people are saying trees, the lake, Oh, Jeff is saying the commute uh, by the Port of Vancouver. So there's so many different ways of looking at nature. Jennifer's saying the ocean. Um, that really make us have that sense of wow and make us kind of our minds and bodies quiet and calm. It can be fresh air. It can be the ocean. It can be walking on Spanish banks, which is a beach, a beach here uh, close to Vancouver. So today we're going to talk about how the places that we live impact the artwork that we create. We're gonna talk about the things in nature that calm our bodies and minds when we experience them, just like we just did. And we're gonna consider different ways that artists create lines and how they use lines in their artworks to create that mood or feeling or express that kind of calm and peaceful feeling that you're all describing. So this isn't like a step-by-step -step how to paint session. It's more of like a session we're gonna learn and talk about an artist. We're going to use those ideas, uh, then I'm gonna create an artwork. And then later on, you can leap off of from some of the ideas that we talk about to create your own unique artwork that will look totally, totally different than mine. So someone's hearing, you can't hear the audio. Can everyone hear me okay? What do you think? Some people can? Make sure you turn up your volume right on your computer, because sometimes I've done that before, where I didn't turn up the volume loud enough. All right, the anticipation has mounted here. Today, we are going to talk about the incredible life story of the artist Takao Tanabe. Takao Tanabe, you can try and say it as well. So Takao Tanabe has lived and worked and learned in many different places and has spent 60 years working in different styles and different materials to express what brings him a sense of calm and peace of mind. And for him, that's the landscape of Western Canada. And we talked, well, we kind of touched on some of the things that we see in nature already. And when I say the word landscape, has everyone heard that word before? Landscape? What does that mean to you? What is a landscape? It's kind of like everything that you can see when you look across an area of land. And Ed is saying it's like what you see outdoors in nature. Maxime is saying life. Life can be a landscape. But if you look at it in the art world, a landscape is like a painting or an artwork that's about a scene that the artist sees. So Takao Tanabe's passion for painting has taken him all over the world to learn new things. 
His story proves the importance of learning from other artists and then adding his own unique voice and vision. He's a painter, a designer, a typographer, a private printer, a calligrapher, and a teacher. When asked if he had any advice for artists, he said, no, if you've got to be an artist, you've got to be an artist. There's no advice to give. You have to have the drive or you don't. And that's an individual choice. So drive means that ability to work very hard towards something that you're passionate about, or that's really important to you, even if that work takes a very long time. So when describing the way that he paints, Takao Tanabe said, the views I love are the gray mists, the rain obscured islands and the clouds that hide the details. However, as much as we want clarity in all the details of our lives, there are always unexpected events that cloud and change our course. Life is rugged. The typical weather of the coast is just like that. Just enough detail to make it interesting, but not so clear as to be boring or overwhelming it can be a symbol for life. So let's dive into the thoughtful world of Takoa Tanabe. Are you ready, Melissa? I'm ready. Everybody else, we're ready to go. Let's take a look at this um, film, which was created by the Knowledge Network. We're very lucky that they um, allowed us to use it today. Let's take a look here. I'm gonna add a link to watch the entire video into the chat so you can cut and paste it's from a series called landscape as muse and it's a lot of different canadian artists and thinkers have different uh, episodes you can check them all out so here we see tanabe sketching he's kind of walked around the landscape already and spent time with it and take a look how he's creating lines to show us what he notices So he's not including every single detail that he sees. He's just really using lines and he's keeping his eyes often. He'll look up at the landscape, keeping his eyes on the landscape and then look down to sketch. So we're very lucky here in BC that we get to see landscape views that look like this. So let's take a look at a photo of Tanabe. We are gonna talk about ways that we can take inspiration from his process of kind of being with and reflecting on what he sees in nature and in landscapes. And we're gonna think about how we can create lines and shapes to share what we notice in landscapes too. So Tanabe's experimentation with different styles of painting and art making are inspired by the places he's traveled, by people he has met, and he didn't wait for other people to make opportunities for him. He's very smart and he creates opportunities for himself and always has. Tanabe was born in Seal Cove, Prince Rupert, BC in 1926. His father was a commercial fisherman and Tanabe frequently went with his father to fishing camps on Skeena River. By the way, his family included seven children and they all moved to Vancouver from um, Seal Cove when he was 11. He went to high school in Vancouver until he was in grade 10 when World War II changed the way the Japanese Canadians were treated in Canada. Takao and his family were uprooted. That means the government of Canada said they had to leave their home in Vancouver and they were sent to live in a place called Lemon Creek Internment Camp. So to learn more about the history of Japanese Canadians in Canada, there's some really, really wonderful resources that have been created by the Nikkei Cultural Center and Museum. And I'm going to place the links to some of these incredible resources. You can see them in the slide there. I'll put them in the chat as well, um, because then you can click on them or you can copy and paste and take a look later. Um, and you can have some conversations with your families um, about what you learned. Well, instead of living in Lemon Creek, Tanabe's brothers and sister went to Winnipeg. And later on in 1944, uh, Tak went there to join them. Tanabe dreamt of going to university, but since his high school was cut short, it would be difficult to get accepted. Now, the links aren't showing up in the chat, someone just said, so I'm just gonna repost those and make sure everyone um, can see them because they're, it's, they're really fantastic resources. Can everyone see that? 
So you can copy and paste them from there. And then I'm also just gonna go back and make sure that you have the link. Thank you for letting me know. The link also for um, uh, Landscapes as Muse, uh, that you can watch the entire film that we watched a clip of. All right. So, like I said, this is a great time that you can go ahead and copy and paste those links and talk about some of the resources later. Now, what I was thinking about was how Takao Tanabe, he really wanted to go to university, but his high school was cut short and he knew it would be difficult to get accepted into university. So he had to be very clever and he is very clever. Uh, he decided he wanted to be a sign painter to make money and because of his ability to create opportunities for himself, he was able to explain to the Winnipeg School of Art why he should study there. And he did. At the Winnipeg School of Art, he met artists that had traveled and seen new, bold and inventive ways of painting. The principal of Tanabe's school was one of the members of the Group of Seven. The Group of Seven are a group of painters that were creating and experimenting with ways to make abstract landscapes. Now, I just said the word abstract. Does anyone know what that means? Abstract. Have you ever heard that word before, Melissa? I think I have heard it before. Abstract is when you're using your imagination in order to think of different objects and shapes. Absolutely. Using your imagination. A lot of people are saying, uh, Jeff is saying non-representational or not realistic, not a representation of reality. When I say representation, it's not trying to look exactly like reality. And Alyssa is saying not exactly like real life. Exactly. Abstract is when an artist uses their imagination to create art that doesn't look like anything realistic. Abstract art comes from the painter's imagination and unique vision. And Mary's saying, you get to decide what you think it looks like, which is an excellent idea. Why don't we take a look at this artwork here? Uh, this is actually a print that Tanabe made uh, when he was in Winnipeg. Now, we can think about, does this print remind you of anything? So remember, just like Mary said, you can decide what you think it looks like. We're all gonna have different ideas. And just Dave, David is also uh, repeating that abstract is what you think of it. So Fiona's saying it reminds you of trees and Sherry's saying it reminds you of, ah, geometric shapes. Interesting, we're gonna talk about geometric soon. Tessa noticed buildings and Madison said, oh, it reminds you of pencils. So see how everyone's ideas, we're bringing our own imaginations to the artworks to see them. And Ed is saying, it looks like buildings if you look up. That's really interesting. I like that idea of if you look up, the way the lines are kind of creating a sense of, we call it perspective, um, making us look up, up, up. Marlo is saying tall trees as well. Well, you know what? This is actually called Trees in Sky. You probably, you might have seen the title at the bottom here. And Ed is also seeing the corner of Portage in Maine, <laughs> in Winnipeg. So we don't know exactly what Tanabe was looking at when he created this. Interesting, maybe it was something in Winnipeg. But we do know that he used his imagination to change what he saw in real life to make it look more abstract. So when he was at the Winnipeg School of Art, uh, Tanabe met teachers that had seen that new styles of painting in New York. And another style they saw was called abstract expressionism. So abstract expressionism, they're abstract paintings, but they're nothing to do with real life. They're all about the artist's own kind of emotions. And just like we still have even more, more people seeing different things in this abstract work. Susanna's saying, you see rockets, or David is saying like Jenga bricks. So do you know what? Before this, before he created this, he had never even seen an abstract painting. Teachers just kind of described them to him, described what they had seen when they were traveling. So remember how I said he created his own opportunities? When he was in his early years as a painting student, he knew he would always have to do jobs to earn money so he could make enough living as an artist, just like all great artists do. So he 
took a job as a janitor at the school at nights. And one day he was cleaning his instructor studio and he saw on his easel a kind of art he'd never seen before. It was abstract art. When Tanabe finished school in Winnipeg, he traveled with a friend to Alberta. And there was an art school there that he asked for a job at and they wanted to, him to help with creating a new section of their school. And he said, I decided if I was going to be serious about painting, I had to go study in the United States. Interesting. So he had heard of all of these places that teach, his teachers had gone in the United States and he had to go and see some of it. So he saved up his money from sign painting and in 1951, he went to New York to study with an artist who is famous for abstract expressionism, abstract paintings that express emotions. Tanabe said, the New York trip was an eye opener and it confirmed in me that I should be an artist and I've tried to do it for the rest of my life. He moved back to Vancouver after his two years in New York since he knew he had to be an artist. And he knew again, he had to find ways of funding so he could travel more. And Alyssa's asking who he studied with in New York City in 1951. And one person that he studied with was an abstract expressionist painter named Hans Hoffman, one of the very first abstract expressionist painters. Now, this is a Tanabe painting that we were looking at. Um, you can actually Google Hans Hoffman and get some ideas of what might have inspired um, Tanabe at this time. So he called these like really excellent years, like I mentioned. And after he studied in New York, like I said, it really confirmed that he needed to be an artist. And he came back to Vancouver. He applied for the Emily Carr Scholarship. And this was run by Lauren Harris, another member of the Group of Seven, those painters that were experimenting with creating abstract landscapes. And when Tanabe's friend gave him a message that Lauren Harris had called and left a message, he didn't believe him. He thought it was a joke. And he almost didn't call him back. But Lauren Harris was calling to say, that Tack had won the $1,200 scholarship. And he knew that he wanted to use this to go to Europe and travel and study and learn. And you know what, Emily Carr did the same thing maybe about 40 years before. So he had some of the money that he saved from working in the school in Banff, and he took two years to study at, in London at the Central School of Arts and Crafts. He calls them again, these excellent years. And he said that this is what really helped map out my life. So his ability to kind of take risks and go places and learn new things really mapped out his life. So now let's actually talk about this painting that we've kind of been looking at for a little while. Let's think about the ways that an artist uses their body um, when they're painting a painting like this, that's abstract. We are going to do a speed sketching challenge. Now, if you have a pencil and paper, you're welcome to sketch along with us. If you don't, it doesn't matter. You can use your hand in the air. I like to do this to, it's really about looking closely at what I see. It's not about creating a sketch that's a finished artwork. That's why it's great to do speed sketch challenges. It's about looking and jotting down what you notice really quickly. So Melissa's gonna time us for 30 seconds. We are going to either sketch on paper or sketch in the air. And as you're sketching, I want you to make up or choose words that describe the lines that you see in this painting. So it can be a sound or a word that's made up or a real word to describe the lines you see while sketching. Okay, Melissa, are you ready? I'm ready and I'm ready to time us. And Melissa's gonna time us as well. Is everybody else ready? I'm gonna sketch and Melissa is going to use her finger. Okay. Okay, ready, set, go. Time's up. Okay. So just like I said, remember, a sketch is not a finished, draw, finished drawing. You can take a look at my sketch here. Um, it is by no means a beautiful finished artwork in my opinion, but you can see how I was moving my body as I was sketching. Now, 
I don't know, Melissa, or if anyone else thought of some words that they could make up or use to describe the lines that they saw while they were sketching. Um, I kind of felt like my hand was moving like, like, whoa, 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 whoa. And then I kind of felt like, okay, when I look at, even when I look at this wonderful sketch I've created, Fiona said you notice kind of bubbles as you're sketching, cool. And Madison says kind of swirly, whirly, whirly. And Susanna said pods, so pods like little tiny circles. And Sherry noticed curved lines as well. What I thought about, they weren't even as descriptive as these ones. And oh, Nicole is saying oohs and oohs. So thinking about those sounds again. I was thinking about the words kind of connected and disconnected. I was thinking of the circles at the top as all connected together, but then I got to this kind of place where things started to become a bit disconnected. And David is saying, you notice bubbles and circles. Oh, and Mary said chains, which is interesting. That idea that I was thinking of about connected, when I think of a chain, is very much uh, connected. So let's compare this with another painting that he did around this time, a couple of years later, actually. Let's take a look. Now, shall we try to do another speech sketch? What do you think, Melissa? Should we try to do another speech sketch? Yeah, let's do another one. That was really fun. Let's try. Melissa's gonna time us again. People are still excited saying um, the words that they're using to describe like lily pads or half moons. Now let's shift our focus to this other artwork and we're gonna sketch again and think about how these lines are different. Okay, I'm ready to go. Okay. Uh, ready, set, go. Time's up. Okay. Again, I really tried to keep my eyes on the painting and sketch without looking at the paper, which is probably why my sketch looks like this. But what does everyone think? What are some words? Okay, we already have words coming in. Susanna saying mirror image buildings. That is interesting. Tessa saying water droplets hitting the ground and bouncing off. So you see some action. Um, in this artwork. What does everybody else say? Sherry notices kind of like reflections. That is interesting as well. Jennifer agrees with reflections. Mary noticed a chandelier and mentioned a mirror similar to reflections. Let's take this off. And rhythm, weight, and balance. Really nice observation. So he's thinking about rhythm. You could even see like as I was sketching, as you were sketching, that rhythm and repetition uh, of similar lines. And S Sandra says, bouncing, which is very interesting. I like that idea. I actually kind of felt like I was bouncing up and down when I was with my hand when I was creating those lines. Fiona says like skipping a rock. And what else? And Marlo said dripping too. Someone else said a chandelier. So that idea of something kind of hanging uh, or dripping. Fantastic. So as you can see, we're using our imaginations to look at this and see very, very different things. Tanabe used his imagination when he was creating this. This artwork is called Sequence, a landscape. So some people talked about they saw reflections or someone said like buildings. So it could be either of those things that uh, Tanabe was looking at, but it doesn't look exactly like those things in real life. It is abstract. So that's how we can see things like, it could be like chocolate dripping, like Sandra says because um, we're using our imaginations. So Tanabe said, when I came home from Europe in 1955, I said to myself, so after he created these kind of paintings, he said, I said to myself, I have one more area I want to study. It's the Japanese style of painting. So I had to go to Japan. I finally managed to get enough money together. He received a grant from Canada Council for $2,000. And he said, I went to the University of Tokyo and I asked about Sumi and a teacher who would take a student who didn't know anything about it and just teach me some of the basics once or twice a week. So Sumi, that word that I said, is a traditional Japanese style of brush painting. 
And it's a style that the ink is applied to paper in a big sweeping motion. And sumi ink is made from the soot of pine branches. That's why it's so dark. So let's take a look at this work. Tanabe was also inspired by someone that he saw uh, doing painting outside of a store in Tokyo. And he said it was like, they looked like Japanese characters, but they were very abstract and expressionistic. So he was very inspired by what he saw, these really, really large scale sumi paintings in stores in Tokyo. So taking a look at this sumi ink painting, what does everyone think? You're doing such a great job using your imaginations to look at abstract works. What does this painting remind you of? Take a look. What do you think, Melissa? What does this painting remind you of? This painting, when I look at it, it looks kind of like maybe uh, going deep and dark in a cave or a black rainbow at the top of the painting. Let me just get my pointer out. Um, so here, I think I see these lines that look like a rainbow and here it's like going inside a cave. So Melissa sees it's like not just a cave, going inside a cave. Everyone has so many different ideas. Uh, Jennifer's saying smoke and dust, or Mary said it looks like an ear, which I now see that I never saw before. Chloe said like a black hole. So that really dark ink made it look like a black hole. A person looking upwards with dark thoughts, says Tessa. Very interesting thinking about looking upwards. And Susanna agreed with you, Melissa, seeing a black rainbow. Madison says different size swirls. So kind of using like an action word like swirls. We talked about it before, but with different sizes. So describing kind of the way that the lines look. And some a lot of people saw an ear. Aaron saying smoke. You notice it looks like kind of like smoke. Nicole saying like a dark alley. Or Marlo is saying dark hills. Very interesting, Marlo. I don't know if anyone else got to see, look up close and see what the title of this artwork is. Molly noticed it looks like a question mark and Maxime says it looks like an eye. This painting is indeed, again, there's no right or wrong way to look at it, but it is called Dark Hills. So let's take a look at, I love those like action words too, that idea of like spiral or thinking of too with Sumi, that kind of sweeping motion that the artist used. Let's take a look at another artwork and compare it. Another artwork he created in Japan. So, Let's think about how are these two artworks the same and how are they different? What does everybody think? How are they the same? What do you notice, Melissa? Well, I notice that this, these kind of circular blotches here look very similar to the circular blotch at the edge of this other painting. That's what I see that's really similar. I love that you're saying blotch because it reminds me what a lot of other people are saying. A lot of people are saying what's the same is the same ink. It is, they're both Sumi ink. And some people are saying like an ink bleed. So it's not like a hard edge line. It's kind of like an ink, like a blotch or an ink bleeding or a smudge technique Tessa's saying. Um, they're similar because they're, of course, that deep, dark black some other people are saying as well. And then as differences, uh, Mary's saying the first one, and I guess that first one we looked at is using only black and gray, and the second one has introduced some color. Fantastic. And Davis no David noticed different shades of darkness. And Marlo said watery ink. Interesting. Now, the reason I'm going to guess, Marlo, that you think, you can correct me, that it looks like watery ink is because when a little bit of water is added to sumi ink, it gets lighter and lighter and lighter. It's not as concentrated as not as dark. And Madison noticed that one has straight lines and the other one had those swirls that we noticed. Absolutely. So when we think about differences in the way that he's used line, we could even use our hands again to kind of do a sketch in the air and also different brushes. So Jennifer noticed different brushes. And the reason that we can look at it and think of different brushes is the size of the lines. One is very, very thick swoopy lines and one is thin lines. So again, using that hand to kind of sketch in the air is another way I can look closely and really see the differences. Fantastic. So it's been, now that we can kind of, we've had a little bit of a sense of comparing some of his different works, let's do that one more time. When Takao Tanabe, when he returned from Japan, he moved 
back, back to Canada and he started teaching part-time at the Vancouver School of Art. And it's now called the Emily Carr University of Art and Design. So he learned typography, which is a way like a printing press, a way of typing uh, books. He made poetry books, he printed artworks, and he founded Periwinkle Press, another way to kind of make money to support his painting and art making. He also learned a little bit about printmaking uh, when he was in London. So let's compare two prints that he created when he was teaching at the Vancouver School of Art. So we can kind of think in our minds about how they're the same and how they are different. What does everybody think? How are they the same and how are they different? And they are different. They're made in different years, that's right. So we would have maybe changed his style a little bit. I'm also wondering if anybody notices any the shape, so rigid. So Michelle is saying rigid. Mary's saying they both have lines, of course. So we talked a little bit about those swooping lines that he was making when he was studying Sumi ink. So David is noticing cubes. Like I said, Michelle said rigid. So rigid means like stiff. And Molly's saying lines and angles. They're different because they have a different color scheme. Absolutely, Tessa. But also connected because we see where they're using black and white. Yeah, absolutely. Aha. So when um, Aaron is saying the use of the picture plane, so that area of space that they're created in, one is going right to the very, very edge and one is kind of centered in the middle of the paper. And of course they both have shapes, Celia said. Now, how would you describe these shapes? Is there a word you would use to describe what kind of shapes they are? How would you describe these shapes? Oh, everyone's coming in so quickly. And Gabby and Jennifer and Michelle and Ned and Madison and Stephanie and Celia, everyone's saying geometric shapes. So we absolutely, and straight lines too. There again, that idea of rigid and straight. So we see a lot of geometric lines. And if you haven't heard of that word before, geometric means like shapes that are, you know, like squares or circles and triangles. We can call them by name because they have that kind of a, a, a well, we know them, right? We've seen them before. They're not like a shape we've never seen before. So do you want to talk about how he made these prints? He actually made these prints by a process called screen printing. So these are artwork. These are, sorry, these are prints. They're not painting. They're also artworks. And some people are still saying the shapes and different angles that they notice and the great use of solid blocks and leaving white space to create blocks. I love that idea, Ed. So having those really solid colors, especially the one that's on the right here, the one that's called gate, he's using black, but he's also leaving space to create shapes uh, with the white. And Sherry's noticing the, the stripes as well. They both are using stripes, but in very different ways. Well, let's take a look at how he created these prints with that process of screen printing. We're going to take a look at a clip from a video um, of our friend Ben Duncan, who works with Malaspina Printmakers, which is on Van Vancouver Island here in Vancouver. If you want to learn anything about screen printing, I'm going to add the link right here uh, into the chat. You can check out what Malaspina offers. So there you can see his screen. And now he's adding some ink over top of his screen. He put that paper underneath, and as he pulls the ink down and removes the screen, aha, there you have the print along with all of his other prints. So this is similar to the process that uh, Tanabe would have used to create those last works that we looked like. And again, please feel free to check out Malaspina Printmakers. You can copy and paste it from the chat and see what um, offerings they have coming up and what you can learn from their website. So in 1968, a little while after he created those prints, he worked in Philadelphia. And later he moved to New York City and he was based there uh, for four years. He painted hard edge, geometric, abstract paintings in strong colors. I think everyone noticed that in those prints that we made as well. So let's talk about, someone said rigid, or some, we've been talking about lines. Let's take a look at these works. And let's look for, do you see where there are some hard edges? Or like someone else said, rigid, hard edges. What do you notice, Melissa? Do you notice any kind of hard edges? I see hard edges 
kind of at the corners here. So here's a triangle that's made out of hard edges. Here is the bottom of a semicircle that's making out hard edges. Does anyone else see any geometric shapes that are made of hard edges? I definitely do. I also liked how you noticed the, the semicircle. Oh, semicircle is my favorite. And then here's some lines coming out, which would you say these are hard edges as well, leading to the semicircle, Christina? Um, that's a good question. I think so because they're very like rigid lines. When I think of like really hard edges, I think of bold lines and shapes. So I really see them. Some people are naming some of the shapes. Jennifer sees rectangles. Alyssa sees parallelograms. Good one. Um, and Sandra said that as well. She sees parallelograms. I haven't studied you geometry in a very long time. I don't yeah, know you any of them. I think. Yeah. So we see those hard edges, those rigid lines that are really bold and stand out. We see those geometric shapes. So this leads us to have a bit of a better understanding of what a hard edge, geometric, abstract painting would look like. So, but these aren't just hard edge abstract paintings. You can, might be able to tell by the titles. Everyone's kind of talked about what they remind you of. He calls these landscapes. So again, he's used his imagination to change what he was looking at in real life to create, maybe he's changed the shapes. He's used geometric shapes. We don't see geometric shapes in nature. He's changed the size of things and he's changed the colors uh, as well. Let's look at one more hard edge, geometric, abstract landscape. This is, we can all say it together, by the way. I've been, I've been practicing saying this over and over. So wanna say it with me, Melissa, so we remember? Okay, let's go. Okay, and everyone else can join us. These are, Hard edge, hard edge, geometric, geometric abstract, abstract landscapes. landscapes. And Mary noticed a rainbow in that work, and one of them was called uh, a rainbow landscape. Absolutely. Now, one was an acrylic painting, and one was a pencil sketch. Let's take a look at a hard edge, geometric, abstract landscape that is a print. So this is not a painting. It was made with the printing press. OK. I have another challenge for you. This is our last challenge here. I challenge us all to use our bodies to act out the lines that we see in this print. What do you think? Shall we try? Do you wanna try, Melissa? We're gonna try three different poses that use our bodies to act out the lines in this print. All right. Shall we do it, Melissa? I'm ready to do it, Christina. <laughs> okay, is everyone else ready? Use your bodies. Okay, ready, go. Make these lines here. Okay, let's try. I'm doing the semicircle. Melissa has the semicircle. I'm thinking of these kind of like diagonal lines. I also, I also like, do a diamond. Oh, how can you create a, oh yeah, you see the diamond shape as well. It actually feels really good to kind of stretch my body and move it like this inspired by these hard edge lines. What does everyone else think? Did anyone else try it? This is a great way to think of like how, what lines really do in a painting. They really break up the space and it's also just cool to get to use our bodies and think about line in different ways. So now after a little while, so we talked about all the different places that Tanabe had gone. He'd been to New York twice. He's been to Pennsylvania. He's been to London to study. He was in Winnipeg, in Vancouver. But um, in 1973, the Banff School of Fine Arts invited him back to work with them as a, actually the director of visual arts and to teach their summer program. But he had finally started making money, making his abstract geometric his abstract geometric hard edge landscapes. <laughs> See, it can be hard. <laughs> so he said, you know what? I don't want to teach anymore. I, I want to paint. I don't need a job. But the director convinced him. So from 1973 to 1980, Takao Tanabe was the head of visual arts at the BAMP School of Fine Arts. Although he was hesitant to take it, he said it was a good move because of driving across the prairies to get there. I saw the flatness. And I said, that's my subject. 
So this is a great example of what he saw when he was driving to, out to Banff across the prairies. I don't know if anyone else has ever done that before. And this is where we can really see how he's creating a sense of time of day. And how would you also like think about describing the lines that you see here? We have that major, that most important line right across the bottom that we call the horizon, where the sky kind of meets the land. Now, this is an artwork on paper, and I actually learned a little bit more about it um, from some really great resources from the uh, Burnaby Art Gallery. They have a great collection of his works on paper, and I'm going to just put some of their resources in the chat right here. Some people are saying it reminds you of the moon looking up at stars. And someone saying, is it possible to add color to these kind of prints? Would grays have been an intentional choice for this piece? So this piece is actually not a print, it's made out of graphite. So graphite's kind of like pencil. So the black and white is an intentional choice, um, but it is also uh, possible to add color to different kinds of prints. Absolutely, check out Balaspina. They'll, they'll have lots of different resources to teach you about their expertise in printmaking. So people are seeing different things in this work. A lot of people are saying things like the moon or looking over the ocean on a dark night. So what, why everyone's talking about the sense of nighttime? And I guess you can already tell how he's created it. He's got that sense of, we don't see like the shape of a moon, but I see that a moon is there. Stephanie is saying a nighttime sky. I see kind of like where he's added light. So we can almost see like the reflection of the moon on the prairies. And we see the darkness uh, of the sky that's in the top half. And you know what, if you look at the bottom half, he's actually creating lines by using an eraser. So he's sketched with the graphite. It's kind of like that pencil, like I said. And then he's kind of used an eraser to take some of the mark away. So it looks really, really light, like a highlight or like that moonshine. Um, Aaron's saying like a moonlit contour. Interesting, contour just means like the kind of shape or the way that um, a line or something outlines a space. Um, and Sheila's saying it also seems to capture the movement of wheat. Oh, I love that idea. So that sense of, by the way, this is not a hard edge geometric abstract landscape, but it doesn't look exactly like a landscape in real life. But I like that you yeah, used your imagination, Sheila, and saw like that sense of kind of movement. The lines are kind of going like this, not those straight lines like we acted it with our bodies. Merlo saying it's like an evening in the prairies. So to learn a little bit more, like I said, you can check out Burnaby Art Gallery. I learned a lot from their resources as well. Now, as we've talked about today, we've talked about a lot of things. Tanabe's painting shifted towards painting landscapes that were kind of like simple with not very many details. And he really kind of started focusing on that horizon line. So we can see it here in this print. Uh, this print is from 1994. He said, when I came out to BC, retired from Banff, it was a deliberate move because I'd exhausted the idea of the prairies and I needed a new area. Since I'm somewhat of a loner, the whole idea of mists and fog and storm of the West Coast intrigued me then, and it still intrigues me. So, you know what? Tanabe still hasn't stopped experimenting with abstraction and what different ways of creating lines. So here we see this in a print again. It looks a bit more, I mean, when I look at it, I know what everybody else thinks. It looks a little bit more maybe realistic. Some people use the words representational. There's a few more details as well. A lot of people are saying it's beautiful. Um, it really kind of, when I look at this, I can get that sense of kind of oh, calm and peacefulness that I know I feel when I look at the mountains and ocean and I know Tanabe is expressing in his work. And a lot of people are just saying how much they love this work. So this work is, is similar to a lot of work that he's doing in his later career and still continues to do. And Ed noticed the contrast of hard edges and the soft flow of clouds. I love that. So we do have that really hard horizon line. The clouds aren't, aren't those same geometric shapes, are they? They're kind of soft. And Madison's saying you also love this work. Well, do you know what? And some people are saying that it reminds them of different places that they've been before um, and have seen similar landscapes to this. So I think what I'll, one more thing I'll say is I asked him if he still paints every day. 
And now he lives on Vancouver Island. So like I said, after he retired, he moved to Vancouver. He needed the West Coast, but now he lives on Vancouver Island. And I said, do you still paint every day? And he said, well, not every day. I still have to cut the grass and do the chores. So, but he said that painting is always on my mind. He said, even when I'm not painting, there are times when I'm thinking, oh yeah, I've got to do that. And as I sit and read the newspaper or my book or watch television, I think, oh yeah, I think maybe I should try that, maybe change that tone here. Painting is always at the back of my brain and marches forward. He said he finds it satisfying, but it's hard, hard work. And this is an example of how he's continued to experiment with hard edge geometric abstract landscapes. So we see the difference. Um, this work was made about six years later than the one that we just looked at. Does it remind you of any of his other artworks? You could take a look. Jennifer noticed the tradition of Japanese woodcuts. And I think that's really interesting because this is a woodcut. So that's when a shape is cut out of wood and it's made a print. It's kind of like a stamp. It's not like screen printing. It's like carving a stamp out of wood and printing it. And um, if you check out some of the resources from the Nikkei Center, you might be able to learn a little bit more about Japanese woodcuts as well. So Tanabe is also known for all of these things that we talked about, but also for supporting young artists. So he set up an endowment fund with the Vancouver Foundation, and he sent over 70 people um, to art school with scholarships. He's also earned pretty much every art award that you can win. He had a big part in getting the Governor General's Award to award an art for the visual arts. And he said it was like, a really big step towards the government really acknowledging the importance of the visual arts uh, here in our country. So he's won the Governor General's Award. He even in 1993 was awarded the Order of BC, um, which is one of the highest honors that, uh, that you can be awarded. So now we're going to move into, some people are still kind of talking about what they recognize in these artworks, uh, zigzags and like eyeballs and an orange nose interesting so we've been seeing faces in the abstract shapes i think what we'll do now is i'm going to show you very quickly how i took inspiration from takao tanabe to create my hard edge geometric abstract landscape so i thought of a scene a landscape that i had seen when i felt kind of like that calm and peaceful feeling and then i started sketching i started with that horizon line and other kind of hard edge lines and then I just started to kind of break up the space um, with those different hard edge lines. So I'm still really focused on inspiration from nature, but I've made it look more abstract. So would you like to take a look at how I created a painting inspired by Tanabe's ideas and this sketch? Let's take a quick look, uh, Melissa, at how I created this uh, painting inspired by Tanabe's work. You can see I used, I made a sketch, but not with a pencil, I actually used tape. So when you use tape and kind of layer paint over, it's a process called masking. We call it masking tape sometimes, right? So I thought about what colors, I was inspired by the blues, but I wanted to really mix the colors and add a variety uh, of blues. I even had kind of like a purpley blue at the bottom here. I wanted to add a little bit of red to get that that kind of like that pop of pink that I saw in my scene. Look what happens when you take the tape away. We talked earlier about negative space. So leaving that white of the canvas become my hard edge lines. And there I'm kind of sketching out the mountain shape with tape. And I'm adding kind of a greenier blue color. And then I'm gonna experiment a little bit more with the colors that I have to kind of represent the ocean, but it's still abstract. And then I could continue to kind of layer and layer and create these hard edge lines. Um, but I challenge you to take a chance to do this as well. It's really, really fun and it feels really satisfying when you pull away those, those masks of tape and you get those really hard edge lines. So now is your time to kind of process all of these ideas and you can think of a time when you were really inspired by a landscape and how you could use maybe this masking process to create a hard edge abstract geometric version of the landscape that you love. Christina, is that the painting in the back? Yes, it is. <laughs> it is. So I'm not going to say it's there to hide my kitchen, but yes, it is. <laughs> so nice. I, I, so we all look forward to um, any kind of mask paintings that you would like to do, or if you want to share with us 
some of the shapes that you made to copy um, tax hard edge geometric abstract <laughs> landscape shapes, please uh, send them to us on Instagram or and tag us at Van Art Gallery so we can create a little kind of um, album of them or you can always email Christina um, at cjones at vanartgallery.bc.ca. We look forward to seeing what kind of creativity and art that you've done. Uh, Chris? Yeah, I would love that. So there's my email. It would be fantastic to hear ideas and see your artwork. And then I think Melissa has a little bit of information for us as well, some exciting information. But before you say that, I just want to invite everyone to check out the website for our, uh, more information on our next upcoming Art at Home Live sessions. And if you check out our Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, uh, we post different art making activities every Sunday. So Melissa, would you like to share some information with us? Well, I have some exciting news, Christina. So following health and safety protocols from the government, the Vancouver Art Gallery is thrilled to reopen next week with new hours and special access for frontline workers and new exhibitions and extended ones of the ones that we had before if you hadn't seen them yet. So Monday, June 15th um, is our opening for members and donors and on Tuesday, June 16th, we're open to the general public Special access hours are reserved for 10 a.m. to noon on June 16th and June 19th for our frontline workers because we really appreciate all that they do. So check our website, vanartgallery.bc.ca for more details on how to order your timed entry admission tickets. And I think if you're a member, you also need to register and just book your time to make sure that you can come in at the time you want. So hurry and do that quickly. That's very exciting. Thank you, Melissa. And uh, thank you everyone for spending your time here with us today. And um, yeah, feel free to send us any ideas or questions that you might have. Your feedback is so helpful. We want to hear what you want to learn about and what you're thinking about as well. So feel free to email us or tag us on social media. All right, everybody. Stay creative. Stay connected. We'll see you next time. Bye, thank everyone. You. Bye.